digital identity yeah yeah that's about me yeah srinivas sir is a solution architect in tech mahindra okay so i know him from long time and he's he's has, he has always been a great support every time technically also and yeah in community wise also so, thank, so you, I, thank you thank you okay yeah so then i see a few more people here like within can you just introduce yourself once hello uh yeah uh hi everyone so yeah i i i'll just tell you one thing that yesterday vipin have called me and we were uh, doing some discussion he said that yeah, yeah i know devjani he he have your book he, he's he's reading your book as well so he was very much excited to come here hi ma'am how are you hi please everyone call me by my first name i'm devjani so <laughs> um, and um, yeah so uh, we are going to start in a while so maybe one minute left yeah we are just uh, about to start in this one minute yeah so uh, it could happen that you, you might uh, ask me questions afterwards uh, or send me questions on linkedin and uh, because uh, it's not always possible to uh, have a immediate answer but i'll try to answer to all your questions and in the same process i learn as well hi everyone uh, just to inform you we have started recording the meeting uh, so that you know everyone who has joined the meeting knows so we have to declare that so we have started recording the meeting and I, hi this is vikram so i'm a senior blockchain architect with itsil technologies and uh, i'm glad to be here and thanks devjani ma'am for uh, hosting such a wonderful session so i'm you know looking forward to learning a lot today okay so sure. should i share my screen now yeah sure we can begin yeah okay fine good so hope it's visible oh, i'm so sorry i just i think i didn't yeah let me record it as well i hope all of you can see my screen now yes yes i uh, yeah, can fine great. yes we can okay great so uh, good morning uh, good afternoon good, good evening ladies and gentlemen uh, doesn't i mean from uh, wherever you are joining to this session of global identity solution leveraging with blockchain uh, today we would cover the issues in global identity and um, i don't think that i, I need to do uh, an introduction to blockchain because all of you are uh, well uh, you know educated in blockchain so that's that's fine I, i'll pr probably i'll introduce ssi uh, or self sovereign identity and a little bit on uh, biometric um, and finally we would explore some global initiatives in identity and certain use cases so um, a brief introduction regarding myself uh, i'm devjani mohanty top 30 blockchain influencers from india as quoted by singapore fintech news I work as a self-sovereign identity expert at RTD, and I got around two decades of industry experience. And I have authored five books on blockchain, and that you can find on Amazon. And my latest work is on SSI. Um, so today's session is about digital identity. So let's start with the issue and uh, the need of a global identity for every human and every machine in the world. Probably, I mean, we are starting with every human, but in future it would be also machines because every uh, person in the modern world might have you know, more than one machines or devices along with them smart devices and they also need to have their identity and they also need to um, uh, you know uh, share information with each other with the uh, utmost um, security and privacy so um, so according to a recent report by mckinsey along with world bank around 7.6 billion population in the world um, 
almost 1 billion, uh, there are 7.6 to 7.8 billion people in the world and 1 billion or 1 to 1 billion people globally lack any form of legally recognized identity. So these people are called the invisible people who are mostly women and children from uh, parts of Asia, Africa and Latin America and officially they do not exist. They lead their daily lives without any proof of identity. So this uh, concludes that 13% of the global population do not have any identification document. Um, th that means that they do not have their birth certificates, passports, ID cards, uh, any kind of national identity um, you know, card or any proof of existence beyond their physical presence on the planet. So there are 3.4 billion uh, who have some type of identity. You can see in the left uh, image that there are 3.4 billion who have some sort of identity, uh, but they are, I mean, their uses is uh, limited and um, they're not able to use it in appropriate, appropriately in the digital world. And then there are 3.2 billion who have legally recognized identity and they participate in the digital economy, but they do not have the capability to use it effectively and efficiently online so please note i'm saying online so the, even if they you produce your passport to somebody but you know uh, there should be a mechanism that you can use it um, effectively um, online so that is what we are going to discuss further so there are um, uh, so what the world needs now is a efficient digital identity infrastructure that can help us to reduce fraud protect rights and increase transparency. So digital identity also holds the promise of enabling economic value creation for each of these three groups. Like I told you about three different groups and um, I just mentioned right here, uh, by fostering increased financial health and educational inclusion. So I don't know how many of you might have heard about uh, this project called ID4D. You, you can see in the top left uh, image, this is an image by ID4D. This is a, actually a project by World Bank and they have got a dream that um, by 2030, every person on earth would have an identity of their own. I mean, today, if you talk about all the identity projects, then maybe Aadhaar is the biggest one. But in a couple of years, uh, in 10 years time, you'll find that uh, perhaps ID4D would be the biggest uh, project on identity in the world uh, because every person would have their identity. So, so uh, let's now get introduced to digital identity. Um, so I believe that all of you deal with digital identity in some way or the other. Um, so digital identity is about personal data that identifies you online. So what it means is um, uh, you are using your personal data, some form of personal data to identify you, who you are online. So this is required for registration, um, you know, identity management, uh, authentication and uh, authorization, I'm sorry, uh, and access to any online data or deregistration. Uh, in fact, this is needed for initiation of any business relationship online. Um, so why we need to protect this digital personal data or why we need to protect our digital identity? Uh, it's because th uh, that out of all the data breaches, personal data occupies the number one position. Here you can see uh, the top data breaches of all time. Um, and the organizations who got affected, you can see in the left hand side, um, I have marked it with red, uh, the organizations who got affected through some of the biggest data breaches in the world are as big as Adobe, eBay and Anthem. And the people who got affected are not in hundreds or thousands, they're in hundreds of millions. Um, and the type of data that got leaked are as crucial as bank details, credit card details, and passwords of consumers. So what are the reasons, what are the causes of uh, this kind of data breaches? Um, so uh, so uh, basically, um, the first one is centralized, centralized server, and the second one is weak password. Um, 
So, and obviously there are other uh, issues also like phishing attack and uh, sharing uh, the data, user's data without permission. Like I'm providing my data to uh, uh, organization, uh, I'm, uh, uh, you know, I'm the user in, and they are sharing the data without my permission. So that can always happen with the current model. And then also unintentional sharing. That means let's say that you are going to Facebook and you are uh, you know, sharing some uh, pictures of your birthday celebration. And um, you, know, you are sharing it uh, even within a group, let's say close group, but they are sharing with somebody else and people are able to know that what is your date of birth. And then if they know that how old you are, then they would come to know that what is your exact date of birth. And uh, that, that date of birth is a private information using which you know, it is also possible that people can get um, you know, access to your um, uh, you know, banking website. Uh, so, and also there is one issue called identity correlation. So what it means is, uh, let's say that um, you are using some kind of user ID, uh, which is because there are so many apps you uh, might be using and people have got the uh, habit of using the same user ID again and again. And I mean, many people use their mobile number as their user ID. Many people use their um, prime email ID as their user ID. So let's say that I'm sharing my email ID as my user ID with my bank. Um, and also with my um, uh, with my um, hospital and with my um, employer, you know, my employer or with my um, university where I study. So everywhere my same email ID goes as a user ID. Then it is also possible that people can know that uh, if they you know shake their hands, if these organizations want to deal with the uh, users uh, all data, then they can um, you know refer to that one uh, ID and trace back to uh, me uh, with all my information. So this is called identity correlation. So we need to come up with a model where all these issues can be sorted. So um, now coming to the evolution of digital identity, that means that how we are managing our digital identity and over the so many uh, years. Um, so uh, people, there might be people in this group who are you know, old timers like me who have been in the industry for 20 years or even more. So people know that um, the way digital identity started, you know, the, the way we handled it, the first model is called the centralized identity model. So here the user might log into different um, websites or different servers and for each servers, um, the user has to remember a separate set of user ID and password. So you might be using, I mean, uh, in the background, you might be using, uh, the server might be using a database model, RDBMS model, or LDAP model, or Active Directory model, but everywhere they are using a centralized database to store users, um, user ID and password, and all the users ID and password are in one place. So this is a um, this is a siloed model or a centralized identity model. The second model is a federated identity model. So this is very popular uh, even nowadays. Many people use this. Um, so in this model, we have a identity provider uh, who is handling your login. So once you log into um, to this identity provider, it actually uh, provides you with a token. Now you are sharing this token with different third parties. Um, and uh, you don't have to log into them again and again. Just like, you know, you are, uh, let's say you are logging into Google and you don't have to log in again to Gmail or uh, you know, Google Drive. So there are so many services who, uh, which you can access just with one login. So this is a um, federated identity model. But here also, um, so maybe it is easier for the user because user doesn't have to remember so many different sets of user and password, but then uh, again, there is a centralization of your digital identity. So here, the centralized area is your identity provider, where um, you know this uh, they save the users, all the users' credentials in one place. So in these two models, I'm not going to user-centric identity. This is a 
uh, first approach for decentralization, but this is a failure. Uh, so I would directly jump to self-sovereign identity. But these two models I just discussed about central uh, centralized uh, identity model and federated identity model. These two with these two models, mass hacking is possible because all the data is on one place and single point of failure is possible. So that is why we are you know uh, learning about ssi or self sovereign identity so um, self sovereign identity is a new decentralized model to manage digital identity here we have an issuer that issues verified credential to the user that is set securely on the user's mobile device it might be a um, mobile phone or it might be a tab or it might be even your laptop but this has to be the user's um, own device uh, which the user is not sharing with others um, at the same time the issuer is sending a signed reference hash to a public blockchain and the issuer is signing it with their own private key so um, so issuer is an organization and issued is uh, uh, is sending the data the verified credential to the data it might be um, uh, the user can store it as it is like the name date of birth uh, cost or tax certificate you know address you know these these are verified the, by the issuer and the issuer is converting this to a hash and signing it with their private key and writing that to the public blockchain uh, now the user can share whole of this data or part of the data as much required to a verified organization um, and also you know um, uh, sharing it along with the issuers public decentralized identity so because the verifier need to know that who has um, uh, you know issues this data so two things the issue, uh, verifier needs to know that whether the data is valid and also who has validated this so uh, now the verifier can convert the data to a hash and check that if the hash of the data matches with that on the blockchain um, and if it is valid. The example can be uh, the scenario where the issuer is a, a passport office and the verifier is a visa office. Um, and the user is sharing as much data needed. The user might not need to share it all. Like let's say that uh, my passport has got uh, 20 different information, but the, maybe the verifier doesn't need all of them. So I would just share because it is digital. I have the um, uh, I have the uh, capacity to share as much data as needed. So this uh, at, at a later point of time, if the if there is a need, then the issuer can revoke the hash by altering a small piece of data and the verifier would know that the data is no longer valid so if you are changing the hash on the blockchain so the verifier would check and know that um, even if the data was valid at some point of time it is not valid anymore uh, so this architecture ensures integrity ownership privacy security val and validity of the data so, um, and please note that in this architecture, there is no centralized repository. You may say that the issuer um, can retain the data, but uh, actually uh, what we try is the issuer would not retain any data with them. Um, and also, um, uh, you know, I, I don't have that much time to um, explain it all. You can read my book where I have explained that for every uh, relationship or every um, user to a issuer relationship or the every user to a verified relationship a different id is used this is called a private date so there is a public date like uh, which every every organization would have a public date with which with whose reference they would uh, um, uh, sign with their private key at the same time there is a private date for uh, every organization to user relationship so um, so that there is no need to have a, a unique reference number uh, which should be available to all no you don't need to share that unique reference number of the user to all um, so that is more complex but all right so so how the ssi works in real life 
in real life there are multiple issuers or certifying bodies or organizations so here you can see in the top um, just i have I, I try to do it in a chronological order so in the top you see the hospital then there is a government and there is a there is a university and finally there is a office so let's say that um, alice is born in the hospital and uh, the hospital is uh, issuing the first set of certificate which is the birth certificate of the healthcare uh, VC is going to the user. The second, then C joins up, uh, C is going to um, government for her national ID. So like uh, even in India, the children can have their Aadhaar ID. So this is the second set of certificate. The third set of certificate comes from her uh, educational organization. Um, and then finally, when C is, um, uh, you know, old enough, she is joining uh, organization to be employed. So the fourth set of certificate is coming to the user um, uh, from four different issuers, so or that could be even more. Um, the, then the user is uh, saving all this information to his mobile device uh, more securely. So you can see that there are different set of uh, certificates, one coming from the hospital, then from the government, then from the educational organization, the in-city, and finally from the employer. And the user then can share whole of the data or part of the data or a any kind of combination uh, to different verifiers. So like, let's say that Alice is applying for a loan. So uh, she, would need, she needs to provide a certificate of uh, her age and um, uh, her national identity because she's a citizen, she can uh, go for a loan. Um, and uh, what is her education level, if that is a requirement, and also if she is employed and what is her uh, salary of if the salary is more than a particular amount. So all this data she needs to gather from different organizations and share as much as needed to different verifiers. Um, and then uh, the user can share this data in three different modes. Uh, they are known as the traditional mode, the zero knowledge proof and selected uh, disclosure mode or self attested mode. So in traditional mode, uh, like let's say I'm Devjani and I'm sharing my name as it is Devjani Mohanty. So I have that capability. At the same time, if somebody asks me that, what is my uh, age? You know, if the, um, for processing of the loan, if they need that I should be older than 25, I just would um, answer in Boolean. I would just say true or false or um, yes or no, and that is enough. So in this model, we architect it in such a model that, um, so the verifier would know that what Alice is saying is true and she is uh, older than 25 and at the same time she is not sharing her date of birth. And um, the third one is, um, the third one is self-attested, like let's say that I'm applying for a job and the employer wants to know that what is what are my hobbies so i don't need any anyone to certify that a certain information which doesn't need any certification so uh, so for that sort of data that is called self attested mode of sharing the user can do that as well and uh, there would be a publicly available blockchain where the issuer would send their reference hashes and the verifier can read and check if this is valid um, so, so the SSI ecosystem is usually pretty complex where you need to handle so many different, um, uh, different standards. So, because you know, what I just showed you is basically only the SSI part, but we are discussing uh, about digital identity and that too online. So how this entire ecosystem would fit in a, um, wave world or you know, on internet, how can we make this safe enough? Um, so, and of course we are not uh, doing it with a centralized, any kind of database uh, or centralized model. So let's look into that. So obviously there are so many different standards that we need to look into. We have to see to the web standards um, and then uh, how to authent get authenticated to this uh, kind of ecosystem. That also we have to see what kind of blockchain we need to use. That also we have to see, and also uh, what kind, how to handle this decentralized identity network. So the deed creation um, and the deed uh, deactivation, how all these things can be 
looked into. So basically, in SSI, there are different layers. Uh, there is a public ledger um, and uh, um, or a DLT or a blockchain. Then there is a private identity storage, like for each uh, device and each individual or each organization that should be um, identity stories. Uh, we have to handle that and also we need to have a agent or hub layer which is responsible for the message communication between uh, different kind of uh, users and also there are client devices we need to handle. I was just talking about the um, uh, this device part also. So, so this is the system architecture. Um, so um, in self-sovereign digital identity is not limited, like I said, to data sharing. How would you get access to such a system? So where would you save different type of personal data? Uh, so you can see that there are two different users, Alice and Bob. Uh, so Alice is uh, storing all her data in her mobile device. So you can see that she can store the data uh, either in its natural form or maybe in an encrypted manner. This is her choice. Uh, whereas Bob is um, so sorry. Uh, Bob is uh, actually keeping a separate copy on the cloud. So uh, he is having his data on his mobile device and also in a cloud storage. So that if the mobile is lost, if the mobile is stolen, uh, broken, whatever it is, he can uh, get it sorted with another mobile uh, in no time. But please note that when it comes to biometrics, I'll come to the biometric part a little later. So when it comes to the biometrics, then all the data is on the mobile device itself. It's not going anywhere. For the, for the organization, it's always the, um, uh, in a cloud storage. Can I, can I please uh, request all of you to be on mute? There is some noise coming. Yeah, thank you. And also, there is a public DLT uh, where all the decentralized identities of the organizations are created, and all the reference has against all the claims are going. And also there is a revocation registry mechanism. How do you revoke? I was just telling about how to revoke a, a verified credential if there is a need. So this is handled by the public DLT. Um, all right, now let's uh, discuss some of the use cases. Um, so the first one is the next gen authentication and authorization architecture. So please note that uh, there could be many different use cases across many different verticals, um, but mostly how SSI is used are uh, in two uh, you know, biggest areas. One is uh, the authentication or authorization area. The other one is verified credential area. So now first let's uh, talk about the um, you know, authentication and authorization architecture. So how this can be handled, let's see. Um, so to discuss this, first, let's uh, think that how, what is the best option, um, you know, to prove yourself online? How you know, the personal data for digital identity can be proved? Like, let's say I want to prove online that I am Devjani. So how do you know that I'm Devjani Mohanty? Maybe because I uh, switched on my video and you, you saw my picture before and you can relate to that and you know that I'm the same person. So basically there are three different ways to prove it. One is knowledge, the second one is position, the third one is biometric. So how you uh, knew that I'm the Jani is through biometric. Um, even if uh, you know, I joined as the Jani Mohanty, but anybody can join as the Jani Mohanty. So, so you, you saw my picture on, on my video and you knew I'm the Jani. So the first model is, is knowledge. That means you uh, know some kind of password using a user ID in password, which is in your knowledge and you are uh, logging into a system. The second one is OTP, sorry, in, this, in the knowledge section itself. The second model is uh, OTP. That means you are sent a one-time password to your mobile device and uh, you are using that OTP. There are time-bound OTPs also. Most of you might have used it and uh, then you are getting access to uh, uh, some kind of services. 
And then nowadays people are also going for MFA or multi-factor authentication where there is a hybrid model. You are providing a, a, a known password and also there is a OTP that is sent to you and using both of them you are logging in. But please note that the password can be hacked. There are so many different processes. I don't need to tell you. There's so many different uh, processes may, may be phishing or maybe, you know, man in the middle. There's so many different ways of, um, you know, gathering somebody's password. Um, and also the OTPs, if your mobile is uh, stolen, somebody can get access to your OTPs also. Um, so uh, the knowledge factor can be bypassed. The second one is position. So smart cards, you know, uh, if you have your smart card, you just put, uh, you, know, you just uh, uh, showcase it somewhere to get access to your services. Like, you know, um, uh, let's say that you have your, um, uh, it might not be, it might not be possible before to do online, but nowadays I'll, I'll come to that also. So in smart card, uh, you use your smart card for getting access to your card or maybe your ATM cards, you know, these are the smart cards used for. Uh, but then biometric is something that you don't need to uh, know something. You don't need to remember your password or something. You need to purchase it. Your biometric is always with you. You don't need to remember it, right? So biometric is uh, one quick solution, one easy solution, and it is always with you. So biometric is considered to be the best possibility. And nowadays, I don't know how many of you have heard about uh, hybrid models. So uh, there are uh, smart cards uh, used for payment um, using biometrics. So there are certain, some of the biggest banks in the world who have, you know, have started dispatching this kind of cards to their users where there is a um, sensor, uh, attached sensor. And uh, so you can just, uh, um, you know, press your thumb against it and uh, then instead of you know asking for a password, uh, you can use this kind of card um, and you know get access to different services. Uh, you know if you want to go for shopping or something, you can carry these cards. So no longer they would ask for passwords because password somebody knows your password and if they steal your um, yeah, your card, then they can use it. So now instead, you know these cards are issued and they they are becoming very popular. So there are many different hybrid models which are coming up. So uh, because I'm discussing authentication, because I'm discussing SSI, so I must discuss um, biometrics also. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so, um, so, all right. So how biometrics works, I think that most of you might be having some knowledge. Um, so uh, your biometrics, like, uh, I believe that most of you might I'd be knowing that biometrics are broadly categorized into two different types. One is physiological and one is behavioral. So in physiological uh, is something like your face, your fingerprint, your um, iris, retina, your palm hand. And uh, behavioral is something like your voice, the way you walk, the way you sign. Uh, so these are behavioral. So in both models, what we need is a sensor. So there is a sensor. And in front of which you, you know, you get your biometrics get scanned. So, and then, um, well, then we extra extract some unique features out of it. And then we map and save them as biometric templates. So if you, uh, if you are not aware how a biometric template looks like, it looks like this. So it's just a binary data, 0, 1, 0, 1, like that. Um, and then uh, this biometric template gets saved to a template, biometric template database. So you can see in this image uh, below that the user is the first time, you know, this is the first time when the user is doing it is very similar to uh, the registration process with the user ID and password. The user is enrolling with um, the biometrics and it's getting converted to a biometric database, uh, sorry, biometric template and goes to a template database. The second time is identification, or it is very similar to how we do login. Um, so here uh, you can do it again and again and again. The user is again providing the same biometrics and it's again getting converted um, to a biometric template and there is a matching. So this is a one to end. This is called a one to end matching. Um, and that is a uh, that is a way to do one-to-one -one matching also. So if you are matching it with a, a centralized database, then it is called a one-to-end matching. So this matching is not 
as uh, perfect as you do uh, with the UGRADIN password model. So in UGRADIN password model, if because there are string comparisons, then it would always if you if you provide the right user ID and password, there would be always a 100% match. But in case of this, yeah, there might be a you know, small differences. So every time you do a biometric login, um, there would be a machine learning based comparison with the, um, the existing template DB. Um, and uh, and uh, that would, you know, the system would come up with a score. If the score is more than a threshold value, then the system would log you in. Um, so this model has been working uh, for some time. I, I, I think that most of you, I mean, many of you might have seen then how the biometrics, uh, the, the fingerprint has been working in many of the offices. But wherever we talk about biometrics, we must uh, uh, talk about the spoofing part as well. So spoofing is a method I believe more, might, uh, many of you might have heard. It is a method of fooling a biometric identity system. Uh, so where to, an artificial object like a fingerprint mold made up of silicon is presented to the scanner, uh, which leads to the hacker to get access to the authorized data and services originally made for the rightful owner. Um, so here you can, in the right hand side, you can see this image. Um, so there are, uh, when the biometric comparison happens, there are so many different stages. So so we can broadly define uh, divide this into two different categories one is presentation attack and um, indirect attack there are two different categories of attack which can happen on a biometrics database so first one is presentation attack so in this presentation attack you know people um, create silicon molds out of you know people you, uh, you know get your fingerprint by some hook or crook and then they convert it to uh, a silicon mold and use that mold to uh, you know, log into the system impersonally as you. Yeah, you know, if you are using face, then they may use 3D mask or photo or a video or even makeup or surgery. So, you know, most of the attacks happen uh, in this layer, presentation attack, which happens in the sensor area. But when it comes to uh, the inside, like, uh, like, uh, when you are doing the processing, if somebody gets access to your database, then that is a different kind of attack. That is an indirect attack, which can happen in so many different stages. But I would call it, you know, um, if we are using SSI, I'll come to that. If we, we are using uh, self-sovereign identity, then that can be also minimized to a great extent. So there are many anti-spoofing techniques. Um, uh, so, um, so to avoid uh, the presentation attack because the other part the indirect attacks we can handle through SSI but how to handle this uh, presentation attacks this is through um, anti-spoofing uh, techniques I believe that many of you might have heard about liveness detection test uh, where uh, the system is actually um, uh, providing you the user with a challenge so if you're using your face um, then the scanner would ask you to smile or to um, turn your head. If you're using iris, then it would ask you perhaps to blink your eyes. If you're using a fingerprint, the sensor would check the temperature and pressure of your thumb. Um, and there is, of course, machine learning um, algorithm to study the high quality images. Just, I was just uh, uh, telling you about uh, the, you know, this uh, in the previous, I think, this one. So here, um, this, this payment cards are coming up with um, biometric uh, um, you know, uh, facility. So here, all the comparison, everything happens on the card itself. It's not going anywhere. Um, and also, this, there is a sensor which also checks the, uh, the fingerprint. And uh, it also checks the temperature and the pressure of your fingerprint to figure out that whether it's a, an, the thumb of a real human being or it's a silicon uh, a mold or something. So, so all these things you have to craft on your uh, uh, on your sensor level. Uh, now I'm going to discuss uh, my organization Earth IDs Next Gen Authentication Solution with decentralized biometrics. Uh, so, at Earth ID we are blending. Um, biometrics and self-sovereign identity for the next gen authentication system. So the, so the user's biometric would only be saved on the device. It won't be shared with third parties again and again. So let's see how it, ha how it happens. The time is not allow, but actually we are trying to uh, um, you know, abide by the FIDO standards 
um, so that you know the the biometrics would be saved on the mobile it, uh, device itself. So the issuer would uh, send. Sorry, here first the uh, user is uh, capturing the biometrics after liveness detection check and converting this to a template, which is which is stored on the mobile device itself. Now the user, along with its biometrics, um, is also sending some personal data to a uh, issuer. So the biometrics could be many different types. So like here we are using um, uh, you know, thumb, uh, the fingerprint, uh, iris, uh, face, and, um, and then we are also trying to come up with voice, uh, gait, or the way a person walks, and also palm hair. Um, and the, what the issuer is doing, if there is a need, then there would be a centralized biometric template database against which the user would be matched. So this is an optional part, so which would be needed only if you are going for a national identity program, where there is a need of doing a one to n comparison. So otherwise, you know, this part is not needed. So the issuer would um, uh, send a reference hash to the blockchain. So this reference hash is only for the personal data, not for the biometric template. And then the issuer confirms the certification um, to the user. Now uh, the user is trying to log in um to any third party so here the user is doing the login uh, to the to to the device using the biometrics every time so there is a one-to-one -one matching and the user is sharing uh, different kind of personal data with the uh, third parties or the um uh, the, the, the data that is issued by the issuer and also the issue details that that means who is the organization who has certified me and then um, this verifiers, this verifier could be the same issuer or a different issuer. That means let's say that the um, issuer actually wants you to log in at a later point of day, because the issuer is not saving any of the user's personal data. So how the issuer would know that whether the person is actually a legitimate user. So the issuer would, uh, even if it's the same issuer or maybe a different issuer who trust the first issuer, or sorry, a different organization who trust the first issuer organization, they would convert that personal data to a hash and search for that data uh, on blockchain um, and to check that whether it's really issued by the issuer and signed by their private key. And if it matches, then the user can log in. Um, all right, so this ma is- ma Once again, ma'am, very briefly, can you, can you revise? points from one to nine okay yeah. all right so let me do it all over again so uh, the user has got a smartphone so the user what it it is doing it's capturing the biometry after liveness detection test and converting to a template which is getting stored to the user's mobile device now the user is sending the personal uh, the personal data and the biometric template to a issuer so if there is a need, then the issuer would do a background verification, deduplication, and, and the template would be stored in a centralized biometric database. So this is an optional part. Like I said, uh, perhaps you know, when you are going for Aadhaar, let's say. So in Aadhaar, they are actually, every time they're checking it, and they also need to make sure that um, uh, the user is not creating multiple fake identities for themselves so there is a need for one to end matching in this kind of scenario but not in all scenarios so not um, uh, in all scenarios the issuer need to do a uh, do a deduplication part so one to end matching is a optional um, uh, optional probability and then the issuer is converting uh, this to a hash and send to the blockchain so the hash is of the personal so, data this means the biometric template no, the issuer is sending a hash to the blockchain. This, this hash is uh, created out of the personal data. Something like my name, my date of birth, my, all these things, not okay. the biometric. Not the biometric. No, no, not the biometric. And the issuer is confirming the certification to the user. Now the user, uh, next time the user wants to log in. So um, the user logs in with liveness detection test and um, the user is sharing the personal data with the uh, with some verifier. Now this, this verifier could be the same organization or a different organization. So, like I told you that in this model, the issuer is not keeping because this this uh, step three is the optional part. So maybe the issuer is not uh, keeping the user's details. So every time it.
there is no one to end match so every time the user logs in the user is not sending their biometric again and again so it is only the personal data that the, that the user is sending and the verifier is converting it to a hash like i said the verifier could be the same, same organization or a different organization they're converting to a hash and searching on the blockchain that whether there is a hash, similar hash or same hash and whether that is certified by a uh, issuer signed by their private key and if all goes well the user is authenticated oh, so i hope that it is the use of uh, biometrics to secure personal data biometrics is to log in how do you log into the system okay so because you know uh, we are talking about decentralization why should we again go for the same uh, user id and password model for the okay. logging to this kind of system now people are still doing it you can see that there are many organizations who are uh, using uh, user id and password to log into ssi but we are not doing so, it we so are, ma'am says that this biometric login is on the user's personal mobile device that's right that's right thank you yeah. uh, so, i have a question uh -huh. so in this model uh, a user needs to share all of his personal data no no, no. the hash <laughs> is made of all of the data right yeah so there is a mechanism to do it uh, if you do not want to share all your data then you can uh, you know do it in a encrypted way also so you encrypt the data and share it as much that is needed okay so it is up to your you know the business requirement you know how you can do it so that you know the verifier would not know the uh, data and they would only know that is required uh, hi ma'am uh, vipin here so one mm -hmm. question uh, how to our application will support multiple ways of identity right now we have seen uh, we can access the application using the mobile using the laptop or so many smart devices also so mm -hmm. right now so what i understood is user will share his any data it mm -hmm. might be aadhar card or uh, uh, and any any number based on the country and it will be once it will be approved by the issuer then it will be uh, stored in the blockchain mm -hmm. then uh, then uh, in case if he want he, there will be the multiple ways to authenticate it might mm -hmm. be otp based it might be the multi factor authentication or the biometrics so how this will be matched if there is the one to one mapping how this will be handled here uh, i could not get your question see the thing is at a user's point of view all uh, the user can have multiple devices where they he can have store it like let's say i, I was uh, giving you an example now the user can save one copy on a cloud uh, you know cloud storage also so you are saying that let's say that the user has got a mobile device from there the user can do and also a laptop where from where you can do. correct 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 so to authenticate any application let's take the example of any zomato you can use using the zomato or any google also gmail also so there are multiple ways like the multi factor authentication or the general passwords from the mobile number also similar mm -hmm. way i believe this will be all the it will be always It yeah, supported. yeah, you are right. You are right. I mean, uh, this is a very novel uh, area, and uh, we are researching. Then, in future, maybe we can do that also. Uh, but at the moment, most of the use cases of SSI you see um, on the net, uh, mostly they are like this. Correct. And, ma'am, uh, second question is: uh, Will it be supported by the public blockchain or the private blockchain? That's right. That's right. I'll, I'll come to. I mean, okay. Uh, sure. Only only fourteen minutes okay. left. Let yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. let me quick now yeah so uh, there are couple of examples i can tell you uh, one is uh, i mean live use cases which have gone to production the first one is uh, q ledger's member pass so q ledger is a credit union in us and um, it has got many banks and uh, cooperative societies um, you know uh, working together so so they have come up with this model so this works pretty much like sso single sign on so the user once the user is logged in to um, this credit union or q ledger then all the banks or and all the uh, uh, other organizations who trust the credit union they allow the user with the same access level so this is uh, by sovereign and um, uh, and this is in production the, the model uh, this uh, product is called member pass and uh, this is devised by i think uh, this is devised by uh everin so you can search on on google on this so this is a product which is live 
A similar product is also done by um, Gemalto and Thales Group. And this is a product for you know their banking clients, um, so that you know the, the user can log in using them. And I think in most of them, in both of them, they are using fingerprint. Uh, this one, the yeah, this one is fingerprint, and this one is uh, face as well, uh, if I'm not wrong. So this also has gone to production pretty recently. When I say pretty recently, it's just like two three months so within uh, within that. Um, now, now, uh, you know, I just talked about authentication part. Now, let me talk about, you know, yeah, this one is also authentication. Yeah, so this is a um, this is a use case uh, by the government of Australia, and this is still in uh, in uh, in research phase. I don't think it ha they have gone to production, but they are working on this project for last uh, one or two years. So, Australia government is delivering a digital identity project product. A program that will allow government services to be easily available to people and business online at any time. So the plan is to cover many services through one national level identity for each citizen of the country. Also, most paper-based identity checks would be transferred to digital experience. So some of the services you can see here are like taxation, welfare, uh, healthcare, business, education, social services, banking, uh, etc. So they're also using bi biometrics and liveness detection check for authenticationing users to services, just like what I told you. So you can go and uh, search for trusted digital identity framework by Australia. So this is this project can go online maybe in 2021 because digital projects are you know, uh, uh, you know everyone is in a hurry to deliver the digital identity project seems. Uh, so here also you, you can see that the government is uh, providing some mechanism or uh, SSO mechanism uh, a decentralized SSO mechanism. So once the user is logged into the government services, then there are many third parties who would let the user log into their systems. So similarly, um, you know, this uh, government of Singapore. So Singapore is authenticating 4 million of its citizens online with facial verification. So they are using facial verification and supplied by, this is a product called iProof. You can search for iProof. Um, and uh, uh, no, simple fa uh, facial biometric shake is, sorry, sorry, sorry. Simple uh, face biometric shake provides Singaporean with secure online access to government services. And uh, private enterprises, also the same model. The private enterprises are able to take advantage of this model, um, of this uh, digital identity infrastructure to authenticate customers online. So this means that government would be the first issuer. So if you ask me that who should be the first issuer, because it works like a chain, right? I, I just showed you that if there are multiple issuers, um, then sometimes, you know, I've worked in projects. So the first issuer is government. And then the second issuer would always ask that, can you please share me uh, your previous data? So it would be first the verified and then the issuer. So it, it would work like a chain. The first issuer is having the bearing the maximum, uh, you know, um, the maximum responsibility, and the, uh, the other ones would just check and um, you know provide their set of certificate. Um, so then the next one is uh, Canada. So the um, so in this project. Um, it's a very interesting project. This project is called Tell Us Once. Um, so here, um, the project is to, re uh, to reduce the red tape. Um, uh, sorry, the, uh, the agenda of this project is to is red tape reduction or to get rid of excess administrative burden associated with administration of small business. The project is called Tell Us Once. Uh, we should require any user to upload their data only once. So data would be certified by the designated issuers and then the user can share it again and again uh, to different service providers. So it works on a very similar model. Um, so also there is a very um, uh, you know, interesting use case. Um, so the government is issuing licenses to organizations, especially startups, using which they can work with others. So like let's say that uh, you know, in a supply chain project, um, I'm a uh, I'm a buyer and I want to uh, buy something from Canada, let's say. So th this project is by British Columbia. You can see over here. So um, so, so sorry. So uh, I I will just go and search for all the startups in Canada who are supplying that kind of material which I need, 
and they are certified by the government because you know there could be a possible a lot of uh, you know fake projects fake uh, organizations so the government is uh, providing them certificate and they can share that with third party so it's really um, you know a good way uh, for a uh, great way for age of business uh, then there is a project called i respond so this i i really love this project so here uh, so this is a project uh by a company called uh, sorry yeah the na name of the uh, this is not a company this is a uh, ngo called i respond for combating child trafficking and taking care of elderly so here you can you can see, sorry not elderly only children so here uh, you can see that there is a ngo who is issuing certificate uh, to the user um, and you know the, uh, what the users retina is uh, scanned and on the basis of that the user is is uh, the uh, the child is provided with a deed and the child's parents are also um, you know uh, linked with the child's deed and their the, uh, uh, their biometrics are also captured and that is registered with the user's deed linked with the user's deed now um, this project is especially for third world countries poor countries in africa and maybe latin america where there is a lot of child trafficking the children are kidnapped and taken across the border and uh, they get exploited so every time the user uh, sorry the, the child is trying to cross the border then there would be a border security officers who would ask for the child's verification so they would need the consent of the uh, guardian or the, or the local uh, the legal guardian so how that would happen they would you know in this country because this is a poor country so maybe they don't have a smartphone or maybe they have a phone they might uh, might not have a phone at all or even if they have a phone it's not a smartphone so obviously that kind of architecture that would not work over here so uh, in this case what the parents would do at the time of creation of the registration just like our aadhar the ngo would um, print their date and uh, hand it over to them and then if the child is actually trying to cross the border with that a legal guardian then that uh, document would be produced to the border security officers so they would just check that whether it's the same child from the date they would get a reference and they would compare the biometrics and see that whether it's the same child and whether it's the same guardian and also their digital consent would be needed to cross the border so this is a project uh, which currently is an evad it's still not in production i believe and uh, this is this is a uh, um you know ngo i respond you can search for this and this uh, a very similar use case can be created for elderly also in the developing country developed world where uh, like, like let's say uh, there is a patient uh, who has got dementia uh, and there is a caretaker uh, who has to take the decision on behalf of the elderly so um, uh, the power of art in use cases so those can be handled in a similar way uh so you can also have more than one guardian in such cases um so digital identity is a hot cake in today's world you can see in this picture how many different countries in the world are doing some research or other on digital identity and especially ssi so you can see so many different digital identity projects not all of them are decentralized but i can tell you like the australia one is decentralized the government uk uh, one is decentralized um and uh, singapore one is decentralized um, so they are all yeah british columbia i just i told you about this use case right so all these use cases i mostly i covered so they are using decentralized identity model for uh, for uh, identity for of their citizens or something of that sort and um, and also there are new privacy laws like gdpr who hasn't heard of gdpr pdpa pdpa uh, is a privacy you know users data related to uh, privacy of users data in singapore in india pdpb is going to be um, you know uh, perhaps it would get the green signal pretty soon this is also regarding identity of individuals and um, and i mean everybody is trying something or the other and by 2023 65% of world's population will have its personal information covered under modern privacy laws um and now coming to the area of research because i told so much uh, on the uh, on the architecture but i need to 
tell you that what are the different SSI protocols available in the market because we are in the hyperledger group. So uh, you can search um, the one which is very popular in the market is hyperledger Indy and Aries. Um, uh, you can search for them. If you are on Ethereum, then you got Civic and Uport. Please note that Indian Aries they are platforms, whereas Civic and Uport I think they are uh, they have apps also. So you do not have to do any uh, any development. You just you can directly use their app. Um, then there is a project called Microsoft's Iron. So Microsoft's Iron is a project by Microsoft and. Uh, that is still not um, online, so it would be online pretty soon. And then I'm working with Artha ID and we are using Hashgraph as the public blockchain. So please note that if you're using Hyperledger Indy, then your public blockchain would be provided by the Indy, uh, you know, is available on, uh, backed, up, backed by Sovereign Foundation. Um, so um, the success factor of SSI, you can see over here, how do you make sure that your project is successful? Um, so, so the first one is uh, how good your uh, biometrics um, integration has happened. Uh, you need to have a very good biometrics with uh, 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 safety and security. Scalability is a uh, scalability and throughput is very crucial because uh, we are talking about um, a P2P model, not a B2B model. No, regular blockchain might be slow; it doesn't. No, nobody cares. But um, uh, identity platform has to be you know have to be highly scalable and throughput because you have to cater to the need of um not hundreds but uh, not thousands but millions or billions in future cyber security should be strong interoperable it should be interoperable and, and integrate different identity networks should be uh, you know uh, integratable with others selective disclosure i just discussed in how how different kind of data sharing can happen and that is that is a um, uh, area one should invest on and validated nodes that because we are not working on proof of work model we are working on something like proof of stake model um, which so that it, it is fast it is um, uh, a high throughput and scalability so uh, who are the validated nodes or who are the uh, people who are um, you know, uh, validating the transactions. That is, that would conclude that how safe and sick or and how uh, successful your SSI model is. So we are working with R30. We are using, like I said, Hashgraph, and we are catering to because Hashgraph is a very highly scalable one. It, it can cater to 10,000 transactions per second and 1.5 million transactions per day. And uh, we are also doing on IoT devices. So one person can have multiple IoT devices in future. Um, and that also we are trying to do. And um, uh, yeah, our uh, uh, we are doing our first uh, project, uh, which should go to production pretty soon. So I think I'm, I'm just in time. Uh, I thought that I, I can complete a little early, but, um, but uh, unfortunately we don't have much time left. If you want to ask me any questions, you can. Yeah. Uh, hi, ma'am. Again, uh, same question. It's, it's related to, uh, as you said, there are multiple projects already available. So mm -hmm. right now they are limited to the scope, might be based on the region wise or the country wise. How, in the future, how they can intercommunicate? That would be really a challenge. So there is, uh, we are trying to do that. Actually, the research is going on um, uh, and we are trying to make it interoperable. It doesn't matter that uh, whether you have used Microsoft or whether you have used Hashgraph, whether you have used um, Artelogy Indy, but um, maybe in near future, because digital identity is moving pretty fast. So in near future, you can see a day would come when, even if you are on a different uh, identity model, but they would be able to interact with each other. So basic idea is to share data, right? Share the data and uh, verify data, trust over the data. So we can achieve it even if we are on different uh, 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 different uh, networks. Okay, so how they will intercommunicate? I mean, might be through the services, or it might be possible. I'm working on the, any uh, any pro, any no, uh, blockchain, private blockchain, and somebody is working on the public blockchain. Blockchain. So how that particular communication, think, whether it will be through no, the no. web uh, services or the microservices? No, no, I don't think that it would work in a private uh, model because. Uh, you are sharing your data and if it is a private model why there is a need because that means that all of all the um, stakeholders have to be in the same network right so here the idea is to share your data with a third party 
without giving all the details and at the same time you it should be handy right like let's say you are going to the passport you are sharing your data over there so you are not sharing all your data only the data that is needed no you are, there won't be any um, there won't be any security check in there won't be any um, uh, you know regular onboarding process nobody is going to stop you because you know from a distance you would be able to do it so there would be sensors who would see your biometrics and there would be sensors who would do, you know uh, receive your data and see that it is already genuine data so yeah. you need to have a public blockchain involved ma'am uh, one question is this is like my last question uh, if it is a public blockchain so how we will uh, limit our uh, validator the issues i could not get your question Means there on? will be so there will be few issues also who with the part of our blockchain uh -huh. who will, and similarly the validator also mm -hmm. so how we will limit uh, means how we will identify whether it's a uh, whether request it's came from the any uh, issuer or it is came from the how we will manage those the request the document which is shared by Uh, they all will be the part of the same network, right? It might be. See, uh, one so there is nothing like a issuer or a verifier. One organization can be a issuer at a time and can be a verifier later on, okay, or can but... be a verifier. Yeah, like I told you, now it works in a chain. Like the government is mostly in most of the cases, government should be the first uh, issuer, and the other uh, organizations can be first verifiers and then issuers. Okay, okay, it's like similar like we have. Correct, but it will be kind of a different kind of uh, modules through which they will for the issuer there will be a different uh, screen will be there they will come like in normal application I'm asking in normal if issuer they will just give you can see the list of the pending document they can approve it and once it got approved then it will sit to the blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, I mean. Uh, Uh, you can do so it my, you know, you my, can co it. my question is how the our system will identify whether this particular uh, uh, digital identity belongs to any issuer or any customer or is it kind of a role or similar kind of a role it is a role no it is a role oh, like oh. let's say you got a website now you are saying that you can apply for your certificates here now uh, like let's say you are applying for your passport so there is a website so similarly you are you are sending your data to that website now that website there would be of course there would be a background verification people might come to your place and obviously i mean the, the same that same process would happen for the issuers because they are doing a background verification they are doing a deduplication there would be um, capturing of your biometrics so those things would happen and then they would issue a certificate to you as well as they would send a hash copy to a public blockchain now you, you are visiting another website and they are saying that can you share all this verified data with me now they would all that should be either from this issuer or from this issuer or from, like you know in certain cases they said that we we'll, we would approve only your pan or your passport or three four things right so they know who are the issuers are so you are sharing all your information with them and you are also sharing that who are the issuers so they can just go and check on the blockchain that what i'm saying is um, true or not okay, thank you ma'am thank you um hi ma'am srinivas here um i have two questions um you have presented multiple systems under development or whatever in the production uh, what are the limitations from all these systems that you have identified this is the first question and second question is uh, since this is digital identity users must be stored somewhere in the digital device what if that device got lost uh, is there any retain retaining mechanisms available yeah so even if the uh, i'll answer the first uh, second question first so even if the device is lost or stolen or broken nobody can use it right because you need biometrics for login so that is liveness detection test and that uh, even if it is uh, stolen nobody can impersonate you right so so At that is for that user how to retain that his identity into yeah. the other how device to, how to do that i mean we are working in that area uh, perhaps we can use like a user can keep one copy on ipfs um, but when it comes to biometrics the entire process have to be done again okay okay 
and sorry what was the first question can you please repeat? first question is uh, we we have gone through we discussed multiple oh, systems yeah, yeah. all over the world right uh, yeah what are the limitations yeah mm -hmm. what are the limitations mm -hmm. right, um, right. well i mean the, what i'm i'm talking about is very recent two three months back so obviously we have to wait and watch that what are the what are the issues i think that scalability might be a issue because you know it we you have to start with a solution which can cater to um, you know millions and billions so maybe when organizations are starting with solutions they won't be able to make out that this might happen uh, but with time when more and more users join and maybe in future like i said one user might be having multiple devices so we have to come up with a solution where which is highly scalable um, and you know throughput should be good you know those things um, we are yet to see so that is why we are going for hashgraph but we okay. can also try with hyperledger indi so you have to see what kind of uh, uh, what kind of uh, users you are catering to like what what is your user base so if it is uh, very very big like you are going for a national identity program so obviously your number of users will be very high so what kind of solution would work there you have to do a lot of testing right thank you yeah. Uh, hello ma'am this is bala here mm -hmm. uh, i have two questions uh, the first question is like when we talk about like sharing the identity so it mm -hmm. may vary based on like the uh, i mean verifier right? for example if i am presenting my data to an educational institution for background check i may probably have to share my like okay mark certificates okay date of birth and other thing but uh, the same thing may vary when I'm going for a bank, uh, I mean, loan approval. So how 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 is that like, okay, the set of data or the information that I need to share gets managed when we are treating uh, this personal data in the blockchain? So will there be a uh, capability of to share subset of the information? Yeah, yeah, of course, like I told you, no? let's say that you are applying for a loan in a bank. Now, the um, uh, bank officer is asking for data in different data and they are subsets of four different issuers so you can share like that also so okay so in that process um, the very first job would be to check four different hashes okay yeah that clarifies on this next question is like how this whole solution works from a commercial model right so i mean as an user should i need to pay for uh, each and every time yeah. like yeah yeah so yeah, that is a very interesting question. In fact, you know, many, many of my clients ask me this question, but the answer varies from scenario to scenario. Like, let's say um, you are, I mean, who is paying for it? It could be the issuer, it could be the user, or it could be the verifier, depending upon the use case. There is no uh, one solution that feels, fits all. Like, let's say that an organization is creating an authentication model for all its, uh, all its users or all its employees. So in that case, the organization is the issuer and the organization would pay for this model. Now, let's say that, um, let's say that is a, uh, <laughs> okay, there is a matrimonial side. Then the matrimonial side, you need to uh, figure out whether the, the person is saying that um, I have passed from this organization, I am I, working with this for salary. Then who is paying for that? Maybe, maybe the, uh, the person who is purchasing it right so it oh. it varies varies from scenario to scenario yeah that helps thanks man. Yeah. Uh, hi ma'am this is Aravind. hello hello yeah so ma'am uh, you're talking about identity of uh, a person or an individual right so what do you think regarding the corporate identities in the b2b context that is one uh, yeah. and second thing if you look at identity probably the next thing which is going to happen is matching i mean mapping the identity with the reputation right so what do you think uh, the possibilities which happen in that direction down the line right so first of all uh, you are asking about the organization's identity see yeah. when you are talking about the organization identity that is a b2b use case that is different from here okay so like uh, we are currently trying to um, uh, 
you know, th th so there are, I believe that most of you might be aware that there are different kinds of blockchains. So there is a B2P model, uh, there is a P2P model, like Ethereum works very differently from uh, Hyperledger Fabric or yeah. uh, Corda. Yeah. Right. So uh, in that kind of model, the what we need is different. But in most of the cases, in Hyperledger Fabric or in Corda, uh, so it is a B2B space and we log into that kind of uh, system through user ID and password, don't we? Like, let's okay. say there is there is Coda, right? So okay. in Coda or in Fabric, we have different uh, organizations, you know, and there are there are nodes representing different organization. Right. Now each yes. organization might be having one thousand employees, right? Mm -hmm. Who have access to that node, right? Yes. So how do you give them access through user ID and password, right? Correct. Yes. Right. So yes, we yes. want to we want to uh, replace that model with decentralized identity. So our work is not a competitor of B2B blockchain. Our work is a complement to B2B blockchain. So we can work together. We are not uh, we are not competitors. Okay. Okay. So, so that means that let's say that you got a Coda node or a half uh, ledger fabric node. Now okay. you want one thousand. You have one thousand employees in your organization and one node. You just you just show one node on the public on, on your uh, network on, on your B two B network. Okay. Now those one thousand employees might be having different kind of labels. Correct. So they sh they should not get access to all the different flows, right? So Correct. there are like, there might be twenty different flows, and some people have got access to this flow, some have that flow. So that kind of authentication and that kind of authorization you can do through a decentralized identity, and that can be entirely decoupled from uh, the B two B model, B two B blockchain. Okay, got it. And regarding the reputation, so probably tomorrow, uh, once I get. Earth ID with which anyone can identify me as an individual mm -hmm. on any platform, probably on any digital platform. Right, so, right. so what if someone again keep tracks of where this ID identity has been used across across the uh, digital world or digital applications? That is not as simple. See, I won't say that uh, biometrics cannot be hacked. Biometrics can be hacked. But okay. it's very difficult if in comparison to user ID and password. Okay. So if it's like let's say if my husband uh, tries, then he can definitely know my password, right? <laughs> if my <laughs> if my ch children know uh, 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 try, then they would definitely they would just my daughter just keeps on an, an eye on my my finger, you know the way I uh, use my fingers, and she tells me what my password is, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's not that simple to do with biometrics. Yeah, you can still yeah. do it, and also. Because because like blockchain strongly believes like down the line without uh, trusting the person who, with whom i am interacting i should be able to do something okay whether yeah. it is interaction yeah. or anything okay so now if we are bringing this uh, what to say uh, mapping the biometrics or any what to say any government id so are we not uh, trying to interfere with the uh, general public blockchain vision See here, uh, I'm talking about only the authentication and authorization part. Okay. Now, where those data are used are something different. And also, uh, perhaps I did not discuss a lot about private deeds. So what a private deed is that, let's say I have a issuer and one I have a verifier. Now, okay. my data, when I'm sharing with my issuer, I'm, I'm creating a separate deed for that. That is a private deed. And that is known only to me and my issuer. When okay. I'm sharing, when I'm sharing my data with my verifier, that is a different date. So it is not that simple to correlate. I was I was talking about correlation. Remember, yes, one of the yes. issues is correlation. So this model SSI is correlation proof. So okay. yeah. So even if you uh, are able to see that is an identifier, but that identifier would be different. So it's not that easy. I mean, if you go to the standards. It says that it is not completely correlation proof, but at least if uh, earlier it was like 100% correlation uh, was possible, now maybe um, you know 5% correlation would still be possible. But it, it would be. I mean, we are trying to make it correlation proof. Okay. Okay. So, so does it make? Uh, okay. Probably only with the one who I'm interacting. Their identity is revealed. For all others, it is completely anonymous. That is what you mean. Yeah, yeah. 
Ma'am, I have a question. Um, in this Earth ID solution, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Arvind, do you still have a question? No, no, I'm done. I'm done. My last point is like, so with whom you are interacting, it is uh, uh, visible, but for all others, it is completely anonymous. That is what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it is correlation proof. Okay. Yeah, that is what. Uh, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. In Earth ID's solution, who will be, uh, there are multiple stakeholders involving in this ecosystem that who will be the uh, maintainers of the nodes, who, who should maintain the nodes in this decentralized system? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> these questions are asked uh, to me again and again. Um, so we are actually trying to follow a standard. When you say node, so that means that the node is, uh, in this model, the user is not interacting with the blockchain. It is only the organization. User is only reading it, right? Right. Right, that you that yeah. that work, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, if you are creating a node, if your organization in, and you approach Earth ID to create a node on your behalf, then we will do that for you. So, we are working in two different levels. We are working on platform level also, and we are working in app level also. So, if you want to purchase our, um, I mean, uh, platform level, then it's entirely up to you. If you want to create a node on your own. That also you can do. Uh, as a user, you know, let's say that you have 1000 employees and you want to uh, authenticate our app, that also is possible. So because we are uh, no, working in two different levels. So, yeah. Is my voice lost? uh yes uh it, it was frozen for a while okay so i'm saying that we you you can uh work with this platform on a platform level also on an app level also so uh depending on the requirement of the client we can create a node for them or they can create a node for themselves also with our with our uh, set of you know our the way we work we just we can just advise them okay okay and uh, this solution uh, uh, code base and all um, is a proprietary based or open source based and no, no, how, how would be the code governance happen and rule rule sets will happen how to align with the government rules and all uh, see there won't be any government rule as such uh, at the yeah like uh, pdpb is going to be online i mean it would be approved pretty soon um, so that is also area that uh, we are trying to see that how uh, to be DPA. If it's you are working in EU, then it would be DPA. So those things we are I think we lost entire your answer completely. Yeah, I am also unable to uh, hear. I think ma'am got disconnected. Yeah, let us wait for some time if she can rejoin uh, again. Hello. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, we lost your answer completely. Yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, sorry, what was the question? Yeah, about the uh, data laws, right? Yeah. So, I, as I said, this is a new area, very new area. So, uh, if you go for any SSI network, they would say the same thing they are researching in this area. But actually, we are trying to work on different uh, data laws. Like in India, we got PDPB. It is still not approved, but I believe that it would be uh, approved in 2021 itself. Uh, GDPR is working on. Please, can we on mute, please? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, 
uh, yeah so there are different data laws privacy protection data laws like i said in U europe uh, gdpr is already online uh, perhaps in singapore pdpa is already online um, in india pdpb would be approved uh, it is a uh, still a bill but it would be approved pretty, pretty soon maybe in 2021 um, and there are different consumer laws in US. So depending upon the area that you are working, we can study that and make it 100% compatible to that data, that uh, no personal data law. Um, so, I mean, that is why SSI is formulated, right? So, yeah. Yes, thank you, ma'am. Hello, ma'am, this is Vishwas. Um, I have got two questions. First, like, uh, as you said, that public blockchain will be used for this SSI. So, if uh, as we as we all know that public blockchains are all works on incentivized model. So, like uh, if we are going to bring people, everyone, we are going to uh, kind of give uh, a sovereign identity to everyone. So, uh, in public model, they have to kind of pay for every transaction they are doing. No, no, uh, no. As, so let me let me come back to this uh, slide again. So uh, we are not using public blockchain here. We are using uh, sorry, sorry, we are using public blockchain, but not with proof of work uh, consensus model. We are working on proof of author authority, uh, or which is a high, you know, which is a um, model like proof of stake. In proof of stake, you got your stake or your money involved, but here all the validated nodes, they are not individuals. They're not uh, something like, you know, Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, everyone, every user is a uh, is a decision maker. No, but here only the, the transactions would be only validated by certain organizations, and they work on a proof of authority model. And these organizations are actually the ones whom people would trust. Like um, in Hashgraph, we got because we are relying on Hashgraph for um, for the validation. Hashgraph is a DLT which works in a very different model than um, uh, than um, uh, Bitcoin. So this is not even proof of stake. This is proof of authority. So who are our validated nodes? They are industry leaders like uh, Google, IBM. You can see in the in the in the middle. You can see they are Google, uh, IBM, Wipro, Dutch Telecom, FIS, Tata Telecom, Wipro. Um, so uh, some of the biggest names, and they are the biggest name in each of the verticals. So whom people trust. So this model is very different from proof of work, and that is why Hashgraph is super fast. Like uh, Hashgraph can cater to 10,000 transactions per second and 1.5 million transactions per day, and it is still counting. I mean, they have tested till that, but in 2021 they would test and come up with higher higher numbers. So uh, uh, be it Hyperledger Indie, be it uh, Microsoft uh, Iron. I think I, I talked about three, four different. Uh, Three, four different, uh, yeah. So uh, not Ethereum. Ethereum is uh, slow, but maybe with the proof of stake model, it would be fast. Um, but all this uh, decentralized identity, uh, in a public blockchain networks, should be extremely fast and should be scalable so that they can cater to the need of uh, millions. So that is why the consensus model is good. It's like public permission thing, like just like sovereign, like there are stewards over there. So, so the, the, these uh, trusted, uh, if I say stewards, they will keep increasing if they will keep adding up in future, like sovereign or yeah. they are fixed. Yeah, they would they would keep uh, adding more, but then they would also make sure that because the the more the number, uh, it would be also slower. So that is why they have to make sure that uh, not at the expense of uh, scalability and performance. Okay. So also one question like about DIDs, if you would like to kind of speak about it, like overview and working of DIDs, if you can give a brief. Yeah, DID is a, um, you can, you can go to, there is a website called W3C. Uh, well, uh, I can, I think I can share it over here. Sure, uh, sure. W3C. Yeah. Uh, did go right. Yeah, let me share it over here. I'm sharing to everyone. You can click on this. So there is a um, there is a way to create deeds, and there are so yeah. You can you can read it in your free time. So there is a way to and we are following two different models. One is a W3C for deed creation, and also FIDO model for uh, handling the biometrics. So 
here they tell you that how to create the uh, how to create the uh, decentralized identity how it looks like is you know it starts with dit then hype uh, then uh, colon and then the name of the um, the organization and then colon and alphanumeric like that and this date can be of two different types it could be a public date or a private date so the public date are created by organizations so let's say that you visit passport office tomorrow let's say uh, in a future day you visit passport authority of india so they would say this is my public date so it would be mentioned on their website now whenever a user is sharing some data with any organization be it a issuer or be it a verifier then they would create a private deed and all the users data would be stored against that private deed so that private deed is not visible to other organizations so that would be visible only to that organization so that means if let's say i i have collected data from five different issuers then all these issuers would be the data would be saved with the different deed names so i mean they, the private date and the public date they look alike but their uses is different similarly with the verifier a different private date would be created so the verifier would never be able to know that you know uh, if they even if they are sharing the two different verifiers are sharing the data with each other to know that because you you cannot stop a verifier or a issuer to retain your data right i mean <laughs> we, we can do it that way but you know they can they can uh, overlap that model but even if they have your private data and even if they share it with another another organization to check that who is that user their deeds should be their private deeds should be different so that is why um, the it would be correlation proof okay thank you uh, one question ma'am uh, so far we have discussed on i mean human identity and how about uh, or what's your thoughts on uh, identity for the devices especially iot, IOT devices yeah. iot devices yeah. yeah that is because i believe that you have seen that in our solution architecture diagram we have also showed some um, iot devices remember do i need to show show it again <clears throat> one moment i believe that you all saw this uh, website w3c Sorry, W3C standards. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay, fine. So, all uh, right. So, uh, yeah. So you here you can see that we are also trying to do it uh, on IoT devices. <clears throat> so um, this is a research area. I I don't think that anybody has gone to production or even do it um, using this model so far. Uh, so we are also researching. So in that case, what's gonna happen that the user can have five different devices and for each of them there would be a different private key and public key of course and right. that would be also associated with your identity so like um, if uh, if you got a car which what do you call it um, auto auto uh, self driving car and there is an accident then there should be a, somebody who is responsible right so so that is why you know that would be associated obviously that would be associated with the yeah. uh, with the individual's identity and that there should be somebody who is the owner who is responsible for um, handling them um so obviously that we would be using that uh, public key infrastructure over here um but that that is uh, some time to it so more research needed to be done and perhaps in future in uh, two months time i'll come up with another session where i can share how the iot devices uh, can work so this would be very helpful in many different verticals like let's say um you can do it not only for machines you can also do it for uh, for animals like you know um herding you know herding and tracking animals or uh, you know every animal i think I, I i just shared a picture a couple of days back i just created it and shared it on uh, on linkedin so there are different <clears throat> animals in uh, in a farm and uh, each animal is having a they have a uh, what do you call tag on the on the ear and in a, um, what they call iot device so that that iot device would tell that other that location at the same time they would have information on their vaccination and maybe if it is a milking cow then the milk uh, the time of the milking has uh, has a pros there's so many different informations that it can share with their owner or um, or the person nearby 
who is responsible for doing that so <clears throat> that kind of that kind of things happen but obviously that would work on a public key infrastructure the same infrastructure i hope i'll come up with more uh, in a months or two months time sure sure yeah, that that will be great <laughs> uh, you can see that many of people are still interested to see you back yeah thank you yeah i mean uh, um with your questions i also try to learn um, because these are the questions which get repeated again and again so and we research on those areas any more questions just last one as you said that uh, biometrics will be stored on blockchain uh, on um, mobile devices only and it will be used only for login purpose so it's just like mm -hmm. uh, biometric which we used to do which we which we used to log in into mobile or something like that it's just a normal use of biometrics right it's nothing more than that just uh, yeah but, but then uh, in current model I, i'm not very sure many people are sending it over the net for every login people are sending it over the net that's not something we are going to do we would be it would be matched on the device so i don't know how many of you have heard of the uh, payment cards the new payment uh, the smart cards which has got a sensor so you you log in within that device and you are doing a one to one matching not one to n you cannot do one to n on your on your device or on your card smart card so that entire matching process happens on your device that is a one to one matching if there is a need of one to n uh, for the first time when you are doing the registration at that time you can do it uh, against your database but here everything would be on device so you mean to say that mapping of um biometrics and the keys uh, identity keys would be stored in the device itself yeah yeah so till the device you go with the biometrics from their device uh, go uh, puts the request using the keys and all that's right yeah yeah uh, hi man this is achna so as you discuss like there are different ssl protocols available like hyperledger in the ethereum microsoft in the hedera hash graph so what is the motive or reason behind choosing hedera hash graph as i told you hedera is known for its uh, high scalability and uh, throughput number one um so i mean you tell me any other network which can cater to 10000 uh, transactions per second and uh, 1.5 million transactions per day i mean that can be more but hedera is very famous and also who are the validator nodes it's working on a proof of authority model right so if you if you see that who are the validator nodes they are the industry leaders in each and every vertical right so that is why that would that would bring trust to the user like tomorrow um i mean let's say that you are sharing your uh, identity with me okay so uh, you are sharing from five different sources okay i would trust the one which is issued by government right because government is somebody everyone trusts so that is why we trust the pan we trust the passport right because the government is doing that right you can show me um your you no know, certificate maybe i mean people people uh, have got fake certificates from uh, organizations from universities right there are fake universities there are fake organizations we who can um, certify that this person um, has worked with my organization for 5 years right so people trust uh, different organizations to different levels so that is why one of the success factors of a ssi network is your validator nodes if you remember i was showing you in the circle right like who uh, yeah one of the success factors definitely is i mean it can be very scalable it can be uh, you know good in throughput um, security features should be good but then who are the validator nodes if the validator nodes are big companies like let's say facebook libra facebook libra i believe most of you have heard of it facebook libra actually got the idea of this kind of uh, architecture from hashgraph itself because you know uh, today facebook libra is having top 100 fortune 500 companies as their validator node so that is why that is bringing that trust level to this network right i mean i want to have uh, half of my money on uh, facebook libra let's say then uh, how can i trust that i trust let's say couple of banks because they've got good name and fame in the market so similarly in order to bring that kind of trust for money or for your identity because 
you know if you ask me today what is your most valuable position then i would say it is my identity right so i cannot trust my identity with uh, each and every organization that is why i i um uh, i need to know that who are the validated nodes who are looking after all the transactions happening in each network so here in in hashgraph we got as big big names like google wipro um dosh telecom fis um, you know ibm so big names are there as validated nodes got it thank you anything else Uh, there there is no end to questions and interactions i i see uh, so if there are any questions uh, maybe you can give your uh, linkedin id if, if for some offline questions or they can yeah yeah sure you. you can always send it across to uh, me uh, at my linkedin id the jenna monty yeah yeah and and for those who are not in, uh, in our whatsapp group uh, they can send they can just give your number in the chat box i'll i'll i'll, I'll add you on all to the to our uh, hyperledger hyderabad uh whatsapp group and uh, yeah i think yeah uh, one question i even i have have the same question maybe you have answered but still i am i want to know uh there there's this guy uh, rishi k he is also a solution architect in novartis he have written this question in chat you can just see uh, when it comes to enterprise adoption how would enterprise marry that means interoperability their existing infrastructure if there is a existing inf infrastructure and this is the new uh adoption of this is a new thing then how will this older and the newer uh, infrastructure will interact and what are the some yeah, of the I challenges think, that exist and uh, what are, yeah yeah what are the approach yeah i think uh, first thing first is that you need to update your um, authentication models so the uh, pa the username in password you know modification from you know moving away from user id in password to a decentralized authentication system is something that would fit into any uh, existing application so for any existing application wherever you are using user id in password you can adopt this kind of uh, architecture and just replace it so that would work so so this would fit in any vertical in or, or in any application especially wherever there is a um, you know a banking websites or uh, where high security uh, high security and high um, privacy is needed so i would say that they should be the first one to go for this so uh, obviously i mean um, the industry which is showing maximum interest is uh, something like you know, the fintechs the banks um, payment providers yeah so, so i just did a uh, uh, a talk at uh, pay you uh, one of the uh, one of uh, the biggest uh, payment providers yeah so they are like uh, uh, they are doing this i mean all the payment providers because they are losing mo money right wherever there is a chance of fraud and wherever that is cost you know costing the wherever that is hitting the pocket then you know they would definitely do this so one 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 uh, small doubt like uh, from a developer's point of view how how this assist this and i'm not sure how uh, hydra has graph works if, if, but i am just thinking about how we do map all uh, data like in, in how many smart contracts are is there different 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 smart contracts uh, we have to write for different different organizations no see uh, smart contracts are not used in identity network so you can uh, smart okay. contracts are where the smart contracts are needed smart smart contracts are contracts like logics yeah. so here it is there is no logic as such you are giving no. access or you are not giving access that's it for different okay. organizations for authentication it, uh, yeah for authentication it just requires uh, your uh, it's it's it is app level or not yeah just in matching yeah, yeah. okay. so uh, smart contracts are not a uh, uh, not a work in uh, any decentralized identity it's not a requirement okay yeah yeah i think that that's uh, that's all from today session if if if, uh, if you have any question yeah, you can just want to know more we're already 40 minutes uh, ahead of this time so yeah thanks for so you, you can read you can read my book on ssi you can get a very good idea like because you know learning with a one hour session is not enough so you can uh, read that uh, where i have also given a comparison between different protocols so you have a good idea
So thanks so much. I believe that we are done today. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so very much, ma'am. Thanks for coming and thank you. Thank you. Time on, time on weekend. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.